It's actually 100 years ago this year that uh, Alzheimer first described the, the medical condition which bears his name. And it was really another 80 years until uh, anything was known beyond the pathological description of the disease. And then uh, 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 two research groups, one in America and one in Germany, discovered this toxic substance in the brain called beta amyloid. And uh, then subsequent evidence showed that, it, that this accumulation of the beta amyloid is what is the most probable cause of Alzheimer's disease. Since that time, a lot of research has been done in laboratories all over the world uh, to understand what causes the formation of, the, of this uh, compound, how it gets removed. For example, every cell in the body makes, uh, makes this beta amyloid, but it's only in the brain and only in certain parts of the brain and only in certain population where it becomes significantly increased in amount. So now based on the knowledge that's been accumulated, a, a number of academic laboratories and pharmaceutical companies have been trying to develop methods for preventing the accumulation of this toxic substance. And uh, the results are looking very promising. There are about 100 drugs in clinical trials right now. And some of them look particularly promising. Uh, most hopeful are a couple of drugs which might have reached the marketplace uh, in about three years. Sounds very promising. Dr. Kaplan, you've worked with gene therapy and how can what you applied to your Parkinson's research and the gene therapy there, how can that be effectively applied to Alzheimer's? Well, actually, it is being applied right now. Um, there is actually been a trial of gene therapy for Alzheimer's disease as well, trying to put in a gene for a growth factor, a, a protein that um, supports nerve cell growth and prevents nerve cell death, and that's uh, been done in a few patients, and the results are encouraging. It's been safe, and now it's being tried in a larger number of patients. Um, but I think more expansively, the idea is that with whether it's gene therapy, stem cell therapy, or other biologically based therapies, we can go beyond the classic paradigm of drug discovery where you screen enormous numbers of compounds in a somewhat random fashion to now take advantage of the biological processes uh, such as what you've heard from Dr. Greengard and in a more targeted way use that biological knowledge to intervene in a targeted uh, physiological fashion. Okay. Let's open the floor to questioning. Raise your hand so we know where to get the microphone. Who has the microphone? Jamie, over here. What does Aricet do for the brain? Uh, Aricet, uh, nerve cells communicate with each other by means of a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And there, we know about a hundred such neurotransmitters. One of them is called acetylcholine, and acetylcholine, like all of the other neurotransmitters in the brain, gets released from one nerve cell, a sending cell, and gets detected by a target cell. But nature has uh, endowed mechanisms for destroying the neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine, and what the Aricep does is prevent the breakdown of this acetylcholine, so there's more acetylcholine being used as a signal between uh, nerve cells. And that, for empirical reasons, uh, it has had beneficial effects in, uh, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Does there are, there are other research being done in pharmaceutical companies now to either mimic the acetylcholine or to find ways of increasing its release or to prevent its breakdown. So all of these are valid approaches. I would add that this gene therapy approach that I mentioned that's been tried, this growth factor was designed to try to increase um, the uh, function of the cells that make this acetylcholine naturally in the brain. So it again tries to play off the same type of, of approach. Okay. 